All right, good evening, good evening, everyone. All right, I hope everyone's day is uh, going well, and I know tonight will go well. We uh, look forward and we're thankful that all of you are here tonight. Um, we have just a few additions to the announcements that I'll go ahead and go over. Um, we, Let's start off with uh, Saturday. Saturday. Saturday uh, is uh, our sister Margaret um, Johnston's funeral. Um, it's been announced quite a bit, so it will be the services will be at 2 p.m. and we still need uh, all to sign up for sandwiches, finger foods, dishes, desserts, please let us know. We're expecting somewhat of a crowd. Uh, so please um, sign up on that and make sure that we're prepared for this event. For those that are participating in the service, we'd like you to be here 45 minutes early, 45 minutes early at the building. All right, so we can make sure that we have everything done, have everything coordinated. Um, still, if you have cards or anything, you can send those to uh, uh, Sister Cecilia, Cecilia Dilday, and her address is in the announcements. We can put it on the board or Rose Overcash, uh, Overcast, and her ad address will also be placed on the bulletin board. So we have that. Um, then we have... Uh, Gregory Parker, Sister Washington's son who passed away. And we have information this afternoon that says that his viewing will be Sunday, the 28th, at uh, the Metropolitan Funeral Home. And in addition to that, his funeral service will be on Monday at 11 a.m. at the Gethsemane Community Fellowship Baptist Church. Uh, for those who would like to uh, attend the funeral, and we'll have this posted. The burial will actually be on Friday, February the 2nd, at the Albert G. Horton Jr. Veteran Cemetery. So we'll get this information posted it on the board. Um, other than that, we have uh, updates on Robin Hope. She's been exposed to COVID. Uh, Vanessa Trotter has COVID. Sandra Muldrow uh, is still asking for prayers. Please remember her in her prayers. Um, we also have the um, uh, the gospel meeting is now posted for May 26th through the 29th. So please keep that uh, in your on your calendar, and there will be more information coming out about that, Brother Michael Height um, from the uh, Bear Bible Institute will be the guest speaker, and I'm sure there'll be a flyer and some more information posted about that. The light posts, uh, for those of you who are going on the light posts, they want everyone, all of the members here, to please log in on the light posts, make sure you can look at the information, make sure everything's okay, and then if you have any issues, 
Update it as much as you can. If you have any questions, see our sister Verne Wine. The Lads to Leaders Conference is also in the bulletin. We have quite a few uh, that are on our sick list and we want to make sure that everyone please keep them, uh, those on our sick list, uh, in their prayers. We have um, Lads to Leaders uh, will be on the 2nd of February at 7 p.m. 2nd of February, please again, try your best to come out and uh, support that. Are there any more spaces for people to sign up for teaching? Do we have any more spaces for teachers? Um, please check the bulletin board for Lads to Leaders and make sure there are no gaps. We still need people to sign up, we still need people to uh, bring food uh, and support our young people if you can. Please uh, participate in that. With that, unless there are any further announcements or corrections, we will begin our service. Please remember that we do have an unattended nursery in the back if you need that. Uh, we have the cry room that's also here behind the glass uh, windows. And uh, our next service will be on Sunday morning, beginning at 9.30 for our Bible study, 10.30 for a worship service. And we hope to see you all here. Thank you so much. Good evening. Good evening. First song will be 545. I only put two songs up and messed it up. Uh, 545 is before the invitation. And then after the invitation, it'll be 376. 376 after the invitation. Then for four, uh, 545, we'll sing the first and last verse. Do you have it? This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. Then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land will live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I'd like to say good evening to everyone. For a brief moment, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Romans, the first chapter, verses number 16 through brother, uh, 19. Romans, the first chapter, 16 through 19. 
The Bible reads, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. For everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth of in unrighteousness. Because you may know, because what may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it to them. For a brief moment, I just want to talk to you from the subject, God has shown it to us. Do you see it like God sees it? Some time ago, growing up, my brother and I used to play in the parks. And sometimes on our way home, we would lay around in the grass and look up at the sky. And my brother would say, Thad, do you see that cloud right there? That looks like a man laying down. And I would say, no, nah, that's not what I see. It looks like a giraffe to me. So at times we would argue because we did not see the same cloud the same way that each other saw it. A lot of times that happens in religion. God has a specific way of showing us things, but people decide to see God's word like they want to see it. In the Old Testament, uh, we find in Genesis, the sixth chapter, verse number 13 through 17, God was very specific with Noah when he told him to build an ark. He told Noah to build the ark with gopher wood. He told Noah to the length of the ark need to be 30, need to be 300 cubic. The height needed to be 30 cubic and the width needed to be 50 cubic. It needed to be pitch in and pitch out. The Bible says in the 22nd verse that Noah did everything that God had told him to do. What was particular about Noah's situation? It was never recorded that it had ever rained before. So Noah preached over 100 years and built that ark, and it had never rained. What made Noah obey God? His faith. God shows us his word through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I have come in John 10 and verse 10, that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus, God put his hand on Jesus in Matthew, the third chapter in verse number 14, as we find Jesus coming up from Galilee to the, to the Jordan. And he compelled the reluctant John the Baptist to baptize him. And after they came up out of the water, the heavens opened up and the spirit of God descended upon Jesus like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. God showed us Jesus. Do you see it like God sees it? In Matthew, the 17th chapter, in, in the verse number one, we see that Peter, James and John went up with Jesus to a high mountain where Jesus was transfigured. And Jesus was conversating with Moses and Elijah. Peter was full of himself and said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If it be thy will, can we build three tabernacles? Then a voice again came from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. God wants us to hear Jesus. Jesus said in John 14 and verse number six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. We find after Jesus was brutally, was brutally killed in John the ninth chap 19th chapter. In chapter number 20, after he was buried, he rose again the third day. 
So in John, the 20th chapter, verse number 19, he appeared to his disciples and he said, peace be unto you. The disciples were glad. He breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. But at that time, Thomas was not present. And later when Thomas was present, Thomas said, I will not believe that Jesus is resurrected until I see the nails in his hand or I feel his side. But thank God Jesus appeared unto them a second time. And he said unto Thomas, Thomas, reach hither my finger and behold my hand. And Thomas reached hither thy side and my hand and placed it in thy side that thou be not faithless, but believing. And after Thomas had done so, Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Jesus said unto Thomas, Thomas, you believe because you have seen, but blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. And I'm glad tonight that I'm a part of that group. I have not seen Jesus, but I believe that Jesus is and that he's a rewarder to all of them who diligently seek him. It is Jesus who invites us in Matthew the 11th chapter, in verse number 28. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus said in John the sixth chapter, verse 45 and 46, it is written of the prophets that they all should be taught of God. He that have heard and learned of the Father cometh unto me. We have to believe in Jesus. Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, you should die in your sin, John 8, 24. And if you die in your sins, where I am, you cannot come, verse number 21. He said, repent, Luke 13, 3 and 5. I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. He said, confess me before men and I'll confess you before my Father which is in heaven, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. He says, be baptized in Matthew, in Mark uh, 15, 16, 16, 15 and 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Tonight, you may be a child of God, but you may have somehow fallen short during the week. We give you this opportunity to come forward and to rededicate your life to Christ. And if you're not a Christian, you've heard the gospel message that it's Jesus who saves and he's the only way to salvation. Whatever your decision may be on this evening, we will ask you to stand and sing the song of invitation. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of
Would you bow with me, please? Lord, we're so thankful for this day and for the opportunity that we have been given to come together. Lord, we are uh, thankful for your word and for the guidance it gives us. We pray, Lord, that as we go to our classes, that we will be attentive to our teachers, Lord, we're attentive to the subject matter, and Lord, that we will take it into our heart, strive to reflect your light as we go through the rest of this week. Thank you most of all, Lord, for your son and for the sacrifice that he has made for us. For it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Right. Good evening. There is a handout that's coming out. And if God is good to us, we'll get to it. It goes along with the great story of Cornelius. And there's so much to learn from this lesson that sometimes you just have to provide as much information as you can. While that's being passed out, I'll go ahead and start. You'll remember we're in Acts chapter 10, and you'll recall we went over this slide in the last um, class. We talked about, again, here we have Cornelius has had a vision from an angel. Peter has had a vision. He was hungry. He fell into a trance. He has this vision, and... He sees this thing that looks like a sheet, come, a sheet come down, and it has all these items in it that were basically he never had eaten before. And he said, hey, I won't eat of these things. But that sheet came down three times. Lord to tells him, what I've said is unclean is simply unclean. In Acts chapter 10, that's where we were. And uh, so Peter thinks about this, and while he's thinking about the dream or his vision, 
they have some men from Cornelius who show up at his house, and we see that they show up at uh, Peter's house. Peter invites them in. Um, what we have is these same men, sorry, Peter identifies himself to the men. They talk to Cornelius about what had happened. Uh, Peter says, hey, stay with me, uh, you know, and then uh, I'll go with you. And what happens is he journeys on from Joppa to uh, Caesarea. He's there. He goes to Cornelius' house. And that's where we were when we left off. So now we're going to pick up where Peter actually goes and he meets Cornelius. So what we're going to do is read Acts chapter 10 and we'll uh, take a reader, Acts chapter 10, verse 24 through 33, and that will be where we pick up our lesson tonight. Acts chapter 10, verse 24 through 33, if someone would read that. Acts 10, 24 through 33. Okay. Thank you. The following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I, come, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked then, for what reason have you sent for me? So Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now therefore, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Amen. Thank you, Jane. We're all here to hear what was commanded you by God. All right, so let's talk about this now. We're going to talk about this. First, we'll notice in verse 4, uh, the question to you is, who did Cornelius call together? Who did he call together in his house? His, whole, his family, his close friends, his whole household were there. Okay, his relatives and friends. Now, this is an example of a method of evangelism at its best, right? We want to evangelize. Sometimes it's worth having all of us. When we're, we have a chance to talk to individuals, we can sit down and do the same thing, invite people over to our homes. And from there, we can teach the gospel to more than one person. We can go over lessons like this. But Cornelius had an opportunity. He knew that where Simon was, where Peter was, and he called for him. And yes, Peter came. Cornelius wanted those people that were close to him to hear the good news, don't we? I, only one? Only one person wants People out there today to hear the good news? I, wow. <laughs> I want everybody in my neighborhood to hear the good news. If I could do, if I had my way, I'd have a meeting at my house and the whole neighborhood would be invited. I would hope some of you would take up that same call. You know, I, I mean, we can't be afraid to evangelize. But often we find that People are. That's okay. Next, in verse 25 through 26, we find out that Cornelius engages in some false teaching. All right? Cornelius engages in some false teaching or a false belief. 
something that he has heard. Because what does he do? He bows down to Peter when he comes in to his home. He bowed down, the scripture says, to worship him as if he was some kind of deity. And what does Peter do? Based on the text, he put, did he pull Cornelius off to the side to correct him? I'm going to wake y'all up here. That's right. He did a correction, as we can tell, right there. Why was this important, to correct him in front of everyone? Come on, get those mics. Let me hear you talk tonight. Why is it important for Peter to have corrected Cornelius right then and there? Stand up. I'm just like a man. I'm just like you. Why correct him there? Why not let it go on? Why not just leave him alone after everything was said and done? Just pull him off to the side and say, hey, you know, look, man, I'm just like you. Why not do it later? Allegra? So everybody would know that he's not to be worshiping, just God is Absolutely to be worshiping. Absolutely right. If, if that was not corrected right then, how about that whole household? What would the whole household think? Yeah, this man is some form of deity, and we all need to respect Peter in that way, to bow down. Do we have some religions today where people still bow? Yes, we do. Absolutely. This is a false teaching. This is a false belief. And Peter rightly corrects it right there. The next thing he does in verse 28, Peter tells Cornelius how it is unlawful for a Jewish man to keep company or go with one to another nation. Was Peter just, in today's vernacular, just blowing smoke? Was it wrong for him to go there? Was it wrong? Yes, Sharika. According to, I'm going to get your mic. According to the old law, it is. It, it, it is and it was. According to the old law. Let's turn in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 24. Someone read that for us. You think this might have been on their mind? Leviticus 20, 24. But I have said unto you, Ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. What did God tell? What did God say? I have separated you from the people. These folks knew that they had made a separation. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. In Deuteronomy 7, 6, For you are a people holy to your Lord God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for this treasured, as his treasured possession out of all the people who are on the face of the earth. They believe that. The Jews believe that they were a holy people, a holy nation. And because of that, they knew they could not mix with unclean people. Peter knew that. So finally, after Peter speaks and the, uh, Cornelius recounts his vision, he tells Peter that they're ready to hear all the things that were commanded to you by God. But more importantly, Cornelius was all in. Cornelius was committed. For this reason, after Cornelius said we're all present before God, he emphasized why. And it was to hear, to hear that message from God. That's why he was here. So let's take a look at what happens. If someone would, please get Acts chapter 10, verse 34 through 43, and let's read that in our hearing. Let's let's dissect what happens here. Acts chapter 10, 34 through 43. All right. 
while we're waiting, can I make a comment? Uh, yes, ma'am, Alec. Okay, I was thinking that Cornelius had to been talking about God in some form or fashion to have his friends to come because they wouldn't come, I guess, for something they didn't know anything about. And That's the way right. that they were so ready to receive the word, maybe he might have been trying to you know, talk to them about God, even though they didn't know everything about the gospel. That's right. Maybe anything about the gospel. That's right. Thank you, Allegra. Again, remember, we recognize that Cornelius was a good man. Cornelius, again, as I've said, had some knowledge of the omnipresence of God. Based on what he had seen at some point with the Jews, he knew of God. He knew of God. It's obvious to see here. And because of his knowledge, he wanted to know more. And what he wanted to know, he obviously wanted to share. And so he had his whole household there. Thank you. Good point. Good point. Let's go ahead and read, Brother Terry. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good and healing all who were possessed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And they put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Terry. Now, these are where your handouts may come in handy as we go through what happens here with Cornelius and Peter and the household. With Cornelius and his whole audience ready to hear Peter preached. It's really that simple. He preached. All right? And in verse 34 and 35, Peter starts off with a profound statement that I believe was intended to make everyone comfortable in the household because it has multiple layers. Peter said, speaking as a well-respected man, someone that Cornelius would send for, and have brought forward someone who now he has called his household together to hear as this respected man, he has a couple of things to say that now should put the audience at ease. The very first one was, and, and I think I have all of them up here. The first one was, I perceive, remember, I, this respected man, I perceive a Jew talking to the Gentiles that God shows no partiality. The first thing that should make everybody comfortable between him as a Jew and all the Gentiles now in the room, I perceive that God shows no partiality. All right? Everybody can now relax. There's no difference between you and me. The next thing you are, he says that people everywhere are accepted by God if they meet some conditions. Don't miss it. They're all, everybody can be accepted by God if they meet these conditions. If they fear God, and if they work righteousness. That's the first things that he tells this audience. Okay? Now I want you to think about that. Because my question to you is, 
just because Peter said, if you meet these conditions, were they now saved? No. We recognize that there was something more to do, right? If we keep reading and we keep it in context based on everything that we've learned, just because you're a good person, just because you fear God, just because you do things for righteousness' sake, and God shows no partiality, just because you meet these requirements does not mean you're saved. But let's keep going. Because Peter continued in his preaching. As he continued to preach in verses 36 through 38, Peter told the people about the relationship between God, Jesus of Nazareth, and the Holy Spirit. It's all bundled up right there in those short verses of 36 through 38. Let's make sure we understand this. The relationship between God and Jesus is captured in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. Someone get that. Let's read that in our hearing. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. John chapter 1, 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. <clears throat> he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Therefore, excuse me, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness to the light, that all th through him might believe. He was, not that, he was not that light, he was sent to bear witness to that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man in coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to, the, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, and the glory of... And the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, There was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, and he was before him, excuse me, before me. That's okay. And of his fullness we have all received in grace to, for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth come from Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Amen. And Jesus had been declared. We see that as we understand the whole counsel of God, we see through these the message that is given here that Peter has explained that relationship between God and Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to talk about the relationship with the Holy Spirit. And we can see that in Luke chapter 418, where Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit. We can also see that, let me make sure I get all of these out there, and they're also on your sheet where it talks about, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 through 25, Jesus went out and did good and healing of all who were oppressed by the devil. 
Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 and 25, if someone would get that and go ahead and read it. Matthew chapter 4, 23 through 25. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. And he healed them. Thank you, Allegra. So we see where this is all coming together. And then God was with Jesus, and we see references to that in John 3, 2, and uh, verse 8 through 829. So we have this preaching that is now going on by with Peter. And so then he moves on and he tells him about the death, burial, and resurrection as we move down in the scripture. Remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. If someone would go ahead and get that and read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 4. Cornelius may have been familiar with what the prophet said in uh, Hosea uh, chapter 6, verse 2, but let's stick with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Go ahead. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you receive and, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast the word which I preach to you unless you believe in vain. For I deliver to you first of all that which I also receive, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was again the third day according to the scriptures. Amen. Thank you, Sharika. So he's telling, Peter is telling Cornelius these things about the death, the burial, the resurrection. You know, sometimes when we're talking with individuals, sometimes that's all we need as a starting point to talk to them about Jesus, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. But let's see, Peter goes on. He tells them that he was commanded to preach and testify about Jesus. And Peter states, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sin. So now these people clearly believed. The question then becomes, did Peter just tell Cornelius that all you have to do is believe and you'll be now saved? Right? No. No, he didn't say that. But some take it as that. He just said, all you got to do is believe, and you'll have remission of sin. That is not what Peter is saying. But we'll come back to that. Let's go ahead and take everything in context to see what happens here. Let's read Acts chapter 10, verse 44 through 48. We have this side. Acts chapter 10, verse 44 through 48. While Peter was still speaking those, these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as come with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Clyde. Okay, so in verse 44 through 46... It tells us that Peter was still preaching. 
And then as he was preaching, the Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles and they begin to speak in tongues. Did this mean that these Gentiles now started babbling in some unknown language? No, no. Well, y'all, y'all rough tonight. It's been a long day. No, he wasn't babbling. All right. Did it mean that they were speaking in some language that could only be understood by them and God? No, no. Verse 46 tells us that the men from Joppa who accompanied Peter heard Cornelius' household speak in tongues and manifest God. If these men knew that they were manifesting God, it presupposes the fact that they understood what was actually being said. In other words, these people spoke in a language. And we know this because those same men who were astonished, those same Jews that came with Peter from uh, Joppa, they were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles, just like it had been poured out on the Jews, back in Acts chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Remember, we talked about all those languages that were there, and that's how we saw the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in different languages that were understood by others that were in the room. So now, the question is, surely at this moment in time, this moment, when they got the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in tongues, they had to have been saved. Is that true? They still were not saved because there was still something more to do. Now, hear me plainly on this. Peter now asked the men who accompanied him, the men who were circumcised in verse 45 of our text, not Cornelius or anyone else in the household. He asked those Jews that were there, can anybody forbid water? There must have been silence because Peter commanded them after that to be baptized. That whole household, Cornelius and all of the people that were there. The Gentiles, by following the same process as the Jews, as prescribed by the apostles who were taught by Jesus, now can enter the kingdom just as you and I have entered the kingdom. So in, in a quick review, what we see is when the Gentiles were told that God showed no partiality and had these other items and all you had to do was fear God and be righteous, they weren't saved then. When the Gentiles were told all you had to do was believe, they, they weren't saved then. God, God could have combined those two, but they still would not have been saved. And there's a third thing where the Holy Spirit now comes. And there are many people who have Holy Spirit-led services where the Holy Spirit causes people to do all kinds of things from convulsions, to rolling around, to doing all kind of crazy things. They even speak in tongues. Not intelligible to many or anybody else, but they were not saved. Only until they did something else. Only until. And that is, they had to be baptized. They were baptized. That was the requirement, among other things. So I want to remind you of this slide that I had put together 
to just walk you through it. You know, the fact is that now outside, once Cornelius and his family were baptized, again, outside of those who were baptized were still fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revelers, extortioners. You can go on down the line, look in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 10, Galatians 5, 19 through 21, Revelation 3. It lays out all of those folks that are outside the body of Christ. You got this handout. The Gentiles were in that crowd in some way, shape, form, or fashion, just like you or I, before we gave our life to Christ. And when we gave our life to Christ, then through baptism, which is not just something to wash the dirt off you, it is something where you meet the blood of Jesus Christ and you're baptized. You're baptized. You go down in that watery grave. You're submerged, not sprinkled. And in that process, a spiritual contract is signed between you and and God, between me and God, where I pledge myself to live to Christ, to die to Christ, to live holy as Christ is holy. That's the same pledge you pledged. That's the same pledge that now these Gentiles have made. They've signed a spiritual contract. And in that signing of the contract, now they're in a place where there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither circumcised or uncircumcised. They're people just like you and me who have now entered the body of Christ and have become part of the kingdom. This same thing stands, stood then, and it still stands today. And Cornelius is a great example of it all that gave us an opportunity to become part of the Lord's kingdom. That, my folks, brings us to an end of chapter 10, and we will move next week, Lord willing, into chapter 11, and we're going to see that that period where the gospel is being spread and there was now a period of peace because Paul is no longer a threat. Paul has become a Christian and entered the body just like you and I. So that period where Paul was baptized and now there is a period of peace where the gospel is being spread and it has now been, the gospel has gone to the Gentiles. That peace is now getting ready to be disrupted in chapter 11. Now the problems begin again. That's the cycle. So with that, we'll go through, we'll have a prayer and the class is yours. Please go with me in prayer. Our precious and heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the things that you've allowed us to learn and uh, study in this class. We, we ask you, Father, that you just continue to bless us and watch over us as we study your precious word. Guide us, Father, in understanding. Help us, Father God, to know the things that we should know and do the things that we should do to continue to carry your gospel out to this lost and dying world. We ask you that in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Class is yours.
Was there, um, Sharika, did you get the second page? There's two parts to this. Okay, all right. Did you get, so that's, let's see, here we go. So, 34 and 35. Okay, that's it. Uh, that's what, that's what. <laughs> well, uh, this is kind of cool. That's good. That's good. Gave me a chance to speed up. <laughs> yeah. And the 11, that's a chapter 11. You want to do that? You chapter 12. I'm going to do it. I did it. I'm going to do it. 